called the Planning Commission meeting to order at 5.43 p.m. Um, my name is Chani Waterhouse, and I'm the chair of the Worcester Planning Commission, and I'm joined, just so folks know who's here tonight, by my colleague Tony Kading, also on the Planning Commission. And on Zoom, our other two Planning Commission members are with us, Will Baker and Bill Arand. Um, and so the former, the Planning Commission is fully present tonight. And um, we had originally planned to do some Planning Commission business first and then to move on to the hazard mitigation plan. But um, we had some confusion with the, with our guests from the Regional Planning Commission. And so what I'd like to do if, if, um, if I'm assuming that most folks are here for the hazard mitigation planning discussion. Is there anyone who is here for the Planning Commission business items? No. So what I'd like to do is um, I'm gonna move that we amend our, uh, revise our agenda to start with Worcester's local hazard mitigation plan right now and move our other agenda items until afterward. Um, and can I get uh, approval from Will and Bill and Tony for that? Yes. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, so with that, I think that my job is to turn it over to our guests from the Regional Planning Commission and from the Select Board. So um, can I hand it over to you all right now to introduce yourselves and take us into this part of the work? Sure. Okay. okay. Uh, I'm Roger Strobridge. I'm uh, on the Select Board. Uh, also working with the hazardous mitigation plan update that we're working on along with Tony Keating and a variety of other people. So that's my job here. I wanted to bring you up to date on a few other things as well. But we have Lincoln and we have Keith here and they're both from the Regional Remote Planning Committee and they're really the, the driving force that's helping us get this hazardous mitigation plan in place as quickly as possible. Uh, give you a little history of why we're pushing this. I mean, we have to have a public meeting, and I'm glad you guys are here for that. But we're looking for input on the plan that's going to be set up for the next five years. And once we get that in place, we get it to the Regional Planning Committee, and then it goes through all the steps where it gets accepted by the select board and so on up to. Once that's put in place, we get repayments when we have disasters like this here in town. And right now, we're at, the repayment from the state is at 7.5%. Once this plan gets cemented and in place, the state will then start reimbursing us at 17.5%. And when you're talking 10% on a $2 million project, I'll take it. So that's why we're kind of pushing this. There may be things in the plan, we're open for discussion and changes, but there may be some things in the plan that we can look at and just say, this works for now. Let's get this plan pushed through and get it in place so that we're back up to that full repayment from the state. And then maybe six months from now, when things calm down a little bit, and we know more of what's happened this year, then we can really fine tune and do a new update to the hazardous mitigation plan and we can resubmit it yeah we don't have to wait five years so here, that's the game plan let's get something out the door and then go from there katie and and just to reiterate that our our last one that was for five years expired january 20th this year so we're in we're in serious crunch time especially because of this FEMA event to expedite this to to get our, our ratings. Yeah. Okay. So what's the deadline to have that approved? We, we are in a... Well, I'll, I'll talk. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Right. I'm, all back when I, I'm done. This. So I'll you Keith. Okay. Uh, yeah, I'm Keith Cullen. I'm the Emergency Management Planner for Central Vermont Regional Planning Commission. Uh, with me is uh, Lincoln Prescott. Uh, natural General, Resource Planner. Yeah, Natural Resource Planner. And uh, is uh, we're 
working on this together uh, to get this plan done as fast as possible. Uh, I'm going to jump to the first slide, or the next slide. Your um, sucks. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> oh, we can move this over. Yeah, we can. Yeah. There you go. Yeah, just Hopefully, got that wrinkle out of it a little bit. Yeah, yeah we can read it. That's good. Um, but yeah, you, you were mentioning, it, and it was no default of the, uh, the town in any way. Uh, the FEMA had changed uh, during COVID the funding for doing these plans. Uh, they switched to what's called a brick grant. Uh, that. So basically, the town knew, you know, your town staff knew this was uh, uh, running out in January, but had to wait for that next grant to come out from FEMA to be able to access the funding to pay to get this done. Uh, you know, otherwise, uh, the town would have to do it all by all by yourself and to come up with the latest standards. Uh, you know, part of a uh, uh, hazard mitigation plan is doing uh, hazard profiles so we actually have to kind of show for each different weather uh, kind of weather event that's in the state's hazard mitigation plan we have to show what that profile looks like uh, and what it looks like for the town with the best data we can get uh, realistically we generally use washington county data because we don't have that down to the town level generally uh, for different hazards uh, and then the big thing on these are the mitigation actions. So for each hazard type, you have to have a mitigation action, or you you can on some of them kind of say there really isn't much risk. Uh, earthquakes is something that's listed in the state has mitigation plan for most of our towns. We just put in uh, we don't usually do a mitigation action for earthquakes generally in this part of Vermont. They're only uh, uh, generally a two or three on the Richter scale. You know you might notice it. Depends on what structure you're even in, if you would even notice an earthquake. Uh, the last one we had, you know, was very hit and miss who actually even noticed it happened. Uh, Can I, would it be possible oh, to try to make it a little bigger and less blurry? Yes, no, and I'm that. also going to yeah. start recording the meeting. And then if we want, um, oh, if we want to get emails tonight too, we can I send the that. slides out, or I can send them to you, Tony, and, okay. and we can make sure everybody get them. So. Uh, yeah, yeah. Right, just let get off that pole. Yes, I think that's about, that's not going to get less blurry. Yeah, that's probably. Okay. Thank you. Recording in progress. And FEMA has changed these since the last time because uh, they used to they used to be an all hazards plan. These are now just a uh, natural hazards is all FEMA wants to focus on. They've kind of separated out any other hazards to uh, Department of Homeland Security deals with like active shooter incidents, those sort of things that used to be and hazmat uh, that used to be included in these plans and all, uh, as well. So they've just kind of uh, taken a more uh, natural hazards focus, but they're also wanting to think about climate change more with these. When did that happen? Uh, in 2023. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Uh, next slide. So the main thing, it's it's an exercise in thinking through uh, how to minimize downtime, so trying to mitigate locations that you're aware of in your town. If you know there's a specific problem location, trying to think through what can be done. And uh, ideally, too, because we don't have county government in other parts of the country, these are often done at the county level. Since we don't have that in Vermont, we end up having to do it at the municipal level currently. Uh, so some of these things we're trying to have to fit it into a Vermont framework, you know, uh, and it's done a little different in other parts of the country. Uh, but it is trying to get the community to think about that long-term planning and thinking about what your risk is. Uh, FEMA from the federal government's analysis of money spent on mitigation for every dollar that is spent generally uh, by FEMA or uh, other departments on mitigating natural hazards, they, they claim that they get see a $6 return over the life of the, those mitigation actions usually. So, you know, um, and FEMA often uses what's called a benefit cost analysis for any of their projects uh, for hazard mitigation, and that's showing that you've, said, you've uh, experienced a specific dollar amount of damages, and they want basically anything on their projects to be greater than one. So for every dollar they spend to mitigate, they're going to see at least that much savings in future disasters. Uh, but from their own, at least from their own analysis, they claim that they're getting a six-fold return on that. And the big thing that Roger mentioned is the state's emergency relief and assistance funding. So this is Vermont's uh, state program. Uh, 
it's a, uh, you automatically get a seven and a half percent from any federally declared disaster to the town. And then as part of being a part of the uh, National Flood Insurance Program, having a local emergency management plan, which is a yearly thing that's done, uh, the 2019 Bridge and Road Standards, and a local hazard mitigation plan, they increase that by another 5%. And then the river corridor bylaws for uh, the town actually has an interim status, so you have bylaws that are strong enough that they considered or did, counted it in when they created that, it gives you another 5%. So once we complete this, that will bump you back up to a 17.5% reimbursement from the state for any disaster damages. So then that town share is only 7.5%. So we'll completely flip-flop from where you are right now. Uh, as soon as we submit this, to, well, as soon as the uh, select board accepts the plan that we're drafting, uh, we now can do what's called an interim adoption. Uh, it's saying we're going to submit it. There may, you know, VEM and FEMA may require edits, but as long as the base of the plan, if they consider it good enough, you know, uh, that automatically kicks the score back up. So from when the disaster declaration comes out, which we're expecting within the next week uh, from FEMA and from the federal government. Uh, realistically, I'd expect, yeah, within a week from Friday, we probably should have that uh, as soon as the president signs it, because there is enough damages already. Uh, FEMA, I believe, has already started showing up to look at damage locations. Uh, we'll have a 30-day window to submit this, to get this plan in, to get the uh, higher score. Uh, and we're moving, that, that's why we're holding this meeting tonight and why we're actually even going to uh, start talking about mitigation actions while we're here tonight. Usually we do that as a separate meeting, but we're trying to get this done as quickly as possible so that we can, because uh, we'll need to have it up on the town website for about two weeks for public comment. Just that's part of FEMA's process, but we, we, we think we can get all that done. You know, uh, and we're definitely, if we have to bring in more staff at our office, to make that happen, we will do that uh, because we realize how much money is at stake. Okay, next slide. Uh, yeah, uh, the last plan was in 2019. It was like right, I think the select board adopted it in December, FEMA accepted it in January. So it's kind of, it depends on what, what you look at, whether it shows it 2018 or 2019. But uh, uh, yeah, the process is. The main thing FEMA wants to know, they want to make sure you, you, you did the public engagement, which we've got, I mean, thank you for everybody coming tonight. This is super important, and it really helps our case of showing the community helped. We got, we got uh, community input. Uh, there also is a survey, and there's a link on the uh, poster. It's on the door as well, and a QR code. Uh, if you haven't filled, you know, filled it out, uh, please do it. If you have anybody else in the community, please ask them to uh, go in. It's just a real easy, like, seven, eight question uh, survey. But uh, just kind of shows the priorities that people have in the town. Uh, yeah, next slide. Um, and actually, we've already, as of today, there's already, already been 21 responses to the survey. This is just one of the uh, questions. It was just kind of showing uh, uh, what the community would like to see prioritized. And so far, it's shown up as uh, structure and infrastructure projects. And then uh, natural systems protection is the second. Okay. And this is just uh, what's it, what are people's greatest concerns, you know, from that survey. And so far, pretty much it's flooding, which is what we see in every community in Central Vermont, you know. Okay. Next slide. This is just to give you the framework. So we're going to start going over this here in just a second. This is from the state hazard mitigation plan. So the state plan, we have to align with the state's plan. Uh, every community, and this is how it works in every state in the country, uh, each state will come up with their own state hazard mitigation plan, and then the, uh, any of the uh, uh, sub, whatever, you know, whether it's a county government or a town, city, uh, they then have to align their plans with that state plan, basically review the same hazards or say, in our community, that hazard really isn't an issue. But uh, uh, yeah, th this is our template to work off of. Okay, and this slide is the town's plan. 
we bring those machines. Yes, yeah, so everybody has the, okay. um, the ranking criteria. Yeah, this is the ranking criteria uh, that was used for this. And we're just gonna, we're actually gonna have to do, we do a quick run through with this. And if anybody disagrees with any of the numbers, uh, we can have a discussion. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's, I'll, I'll read off what the numbers are, just because I know this isn't, you know, the clearest. Uh, but it, fluvial erosion, which fluvial erosion is what we saw the other day. So, you know, you, flooding is broken into two different uh, categories here in Vermont, and fluvial erosion is the number one issue across the state. We see the most damages to, and it's due to our topography. You know, we've got all these mountains, which are, you know, we all love the mountains, that's why we're here. <laughs> you know, if we wanted to live in the plains, we'd move there. Uh, but uh, it's that erosive force when it rains and that water's coming down and it's cutting into the sides of the roads. It's destroying homes at some, you know, sometimes. Uh, this latest event was a perfect example of fluvial erosion. I mean, last summer we saw a lot more inundation flooding, which is where the floodwaters actually come up, you know, in Montpelier, in Berry City, even uh, in the, the smaller towns where it's coming up and you're actually having standing waters or, you know, might be flowing but not ru uh, raging through generally. So for fluvial erosion, you know, when we uh, met with the town uh, planning team, the probability of a fluvial erosion event in the next year, we said, was a four, uh, you know, which is the highest ranking we can give. Uh, you know, I'm assuming everybody in the room probably agrees, especially after this week. Uh, but then going across that, for infrastructure, damaged infrastructure uh, was rated as a three. Uh, if you look on your sheet, you know, that explains, you know, because each one of us kind of has a slightly different uh, framework. And, you know, like I said, we have to align this with the state. The state and FEMA had come up with this framework for ranking these. I know it's not, might not be the greatest, but it's what we get to work with. You know, uh, uh, if anybody disagrees and thinks that should be higher, you know, and that's, that's kind of, we're just going to go through and review all these to start with. And it's just, if you think any of these should be increased, we can have a discussion about that. And, you know, and we'll talk, because most of our planning team is here, we can uh, talk about that and see if we should bump one of these up a little bit. Uh, risk to life, it was rated as a two. I think on, you have a no No, yeah. no. Yeah. Yeah. I was say, I think on two, it uh, could be some, uh, some need for a hospital, but it's not life-threatening. I think I've memorized all, all these by now. But. Uh, yeah, occasional hospitalizations is a two. Uh, you know, in our region, we actually didn't have really any mass hospitalizations or anything. Uh, no one died. Which is a miracle. If you've been to any, you know, if you've been to Plainfield now, it's amazing. No one died. Like, I can't express that enough. Uh, was there Sunday and helping the community, and yeah, people got out literally within minutes of their houses disappearing, uh, like as they got to the fire truck and it washed away. <laughs> you know, it was truly a miracle. Uh, a risk to economy uh, is a four. You know, I think. We, I don't think we want to lower it in this. Uh, uh, risk to the environment is a three, and that overall average then come out as a three. You know, because we just we take these four scores and it averages up, and then we multiply that by the probability to get that overall score of what would rank highest. So uh, fluvial erosion ranked at twelve, uh, and we even had the note. You know, from last summer there was over three million dollars in damages to the community from last summer's event, you know. And we're, yeah, from uh, just talking with Roger, we think this year is actually even worse. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, I mean, I've seen some of the drone footage that's on YouTube now from your town as well. Uh, you know, whoever's gonna be putting that up, that's some really nice stuff. Hopefully we might even be able to harvest some images for using with the plan. Uh, it's also sad to see, you know, at the same time. But it, it's really good to get that awareness out of how bad the damages are. You know, there's nothing quite as good to see in that video. Uh, so moving on, inundation flooding. Probability of inundation flooding was set at a three uh, for your community. You know, 
I know that there's not a, quite as much risk there. You know, most of your houses are set back from the from the uh, uh, north branch here. You know, there's you know if anybody disagrees with that score, uh, definitely speak up. But going across, it's a risk of three to infrastructure, two to life, four to economy, and three to the environment. Does anybody disagree with any of those scores or what think it should be rated higher? It's a little frustrating that it's in one form up there and another form here. Yes. Yeah. Oh, I can I can just kind of speak to that for a second. Um, de definitely feedback appreciated. We could print these out, you know, and hand them out route next time. Just saying it's yeah. better way to go. But for the scoring, like just so you all well, like the worst threat you know, the fluvial erosion, inundation, flooding, ice, and cold, those are the ones where the average score was a seven or above here, and you all have this on your paper, but, um, you know, that that is, I, I kind of summarized this this chart and just gave you sort of the summary of like, okay, these are the ones that got over a seven, that's the worst threat, that's what we're going to dig the deepest to into the plan, and most of the mitigation actions are going to be focused on the worst threat, moderate threat are the ones that average three to seven, and those are the ones that will be also included in the plan, as well as the low likelihood hazards under a three. We have to include all the hazards in the plan because they're included in the state plan, but it's sort of in the order of prioritization of what the community wants to focus on. Right. Yeah. So you, can you, can, can you uh, put all the data together and just prioritize it, basically and simplify it? Yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah. In any order. Yes. Yeah, yeah. exactly. The, the only thing I would like to include in that is I feel like this is compounded. It's every every time all of these things meet our, our town infrastructure, yes. it's because there is more erosion on private lands and up higher in the watershed. And so every time one of these storms occurs, we're carving out like a higher volume and a higher velocity yeah. channel to, yes. to meet our structures. And like that's something that isn't being addressed with any of the improvements that we're making on the road. So no. every single time this happens, it's going to get worse and worse and worse because we have huge gorges that are being carved on private lands that like channel all of the watershed. Mm -hmm. Yes, I, I agree 100% because I mean it, throughout the region I'm seeing that, you know, you're even seeing the uh, rivers adding to their yes. channels. They're, you know, the channel is definitely getting wider. I don't know to be well, honest, I just, I just see us making like an assessment on this scale about the the town infrastructure, but it doesn't say anything about yeah, like what is occurring that is going to compound the yes. next one of these. You're you're thinking of like what's happening on private land, what's happening on state land, and well, so we're talking and about watersheds. Yeah, you know, I know the whole watershed. Like we built roads in easy places because they were available. We're not talking about addressing like the watershed from like where it's coming from. Like we're talking about surface area of thousands of acres oh, yeah. draining into that our roads. That's that can be addressed, and that can be addressed some through. I mean, your planning commission is a perfect example of like, you know, so like your land use planning of how you address those upper lands. Like you know, you know, you have a steep slope above your, your road. What's being done? Whether that, whether it's forested land, whether it's farm fields, whether people are developing that and putting in houses, that definitely makes a difference on what that land use is going to be, and uh, whether you're uh, having those buffer strips, you know, of tree cover, like either along the uh, uh, the waterways or even at, at the top edge of the slope. So, like any, you know, you get a heavy rain, even if it's just farm field, if you've got a buffer strip there at the top edge of the slope you're allowing that as it's flowing through that forest area to uh, decelerate some and trying to buy that time. Because in these heavy rain events, it's all about buying time. It isn't that you can stop, you're not stopping the water. Well, it's dissipating energy. Exactly, exactly. Okay. I get that. I'm yeah. just wondering, like, are you doing anything to like, encourage and address these things? Because like the whole river corridor is a problem because straightening of channels oh yeah or, like all the number of reasons i, I don't need to yeah, any of the pinch speed. points that you may have on that river channel where we've already encroached and yeah yeah i'm just thinking like every one of those things like stacks up oh yeah this isn't like one singular problem exactly that's it i mean we, we've 
to a large extent, we, we've inherited the problems that our grandparents gave us, you know, instead of, you know, because we developed, but it was also a different climate model that they built for. I think it's our great grandparents. Well, yeah, even our great, well, and even great great grandparents. And, yeah, well, we'll definitely try to go back far enough in their day. <laughs> so, it's like, can't go point. <laughs> but, but, uh, uh, you know, it, yeah, it, it's, it, our infrastructure was built for a different climate model than what we are currently living in and what we're going to see as climate change progresses. You know, it, uh, it, it, it's definitely a problem. Uh, we're even starting to talk with some of the other communities about looking at their transportation infrastructure and whether we need to either retire pieces because it's not sustainable and they can't afford to keep repairing the same thing over and over and over again or moving those roads, like actually starting to think of, do you move a road? To a new location, uh, the the Brook Road in Plainfield is currently they're looking at possibly not rebuilding that uh, that entire road through there. Uh, most of the homes that are in there, they're still that still remain. The ones that weren't destroyed, there are other access points from side roads that do link up to Brook Road, so you'd still be able to maintain uh, the homes that are there, but that it would not be a through structure. You know, because how do you replace six bridges? You know, the state doesn't even have that many. Uh, portable bridges to bring out to put in. Yeah. Okay. Yes. I mean, we're probably not at the solution stage, but just to piggyback on that is uh, I, I, I taught class classes uh, for UW out in Washington State. We talked a lot about forestry and also um, the impacts of forestry on the watershed and there's a lot of rain events there, heavy rain events, and how the city was going to deal with that. And one of the things we think I think we should address generally in this conversation, especially now that we might get our range forested, is how they're going to put those water roads in. Mine, certainly on my land, are just now huge uh, channels, ravines of water coming down right from my house. And um, and, uh, and also out on the cows, so as you probably see. So there's ways of mitigating that by putting in small catchment ponds, as we do, which they're doing in, in Washington State and in Seattle, mm -hmm. all over the place. And yes. money to be used. Um, to make these dry catchment ponds. Yes. So that should be part of the forestry plan to make sure that the state is, um, yeah. as they're foresting, that, you know, I agree that it's not just the codes of the town, it's, it's, the, it's the state foresters we've got to talk to and get them up to speed on how to build a lot of roads actually going to work with climate change. Yeah, you know, see, the last thing you want is that skitter path to just be a they, channel. They know, the state foresters are not the problem. Well, are they building the, the dry ponds? Because the dry ponds are what Seattle decided in Washington County. Washington well, it's a different climate, but it's not really it, it might be helpful for this conversation to, because I, I, think, I think we're, everyone's making some great points, but I, I think we're, we, I suspect we might be talking about some issues that are, that are bigger than what the hazard mitigation plan will actually address. Mm -hmm. And so it, it might be good to just quickly kind of talk about, like, you know, I, I know we want to be time sensitive and we need to move through this thing to get yeah. it approved as quickly as possible and we can come back and make amendments later. But I think it, it's important to kind of understand like what this does as a tool and what it doesn't do as a tool. And because we might go through this and all realize that we can do this and this is a good thing to have in place, but we as a town have a bunch of additional work that we need to do and conversations that we need to it's have. It's not an appropriate thing to address. Well, it, I mean, it, it's a thing to talk about. We need to talk about, but it's not like this. This plan might not be that tool to address that problem. I think what you might find further on in the plan, there are some places where we can start to indicate some things. And like maybe in the past, on one of the items, we have said the select board doesn't have the money to do this, but we'll look into it. Basically. My whole thinking is looking at this plan now, even if we just push it through the way it is, six months or a year from now, we come back to this plan again and we start going into those sections and saying, this needs to be addressed. And it's above our pay grade, basically. Right. But we have that information in the plan that gets bumped up to the state and it gets bumped up to the feds. And finally, you're at a point where they're looking at the this is a spot where they're looking at for suggestions and, and things like that. Rather than just saying, Slight Board doesn't have the money for it, we can't do it. 
you know, that's the place I think we really need to yes. focus on down the road here a little bit. And also, any of the projects, if there's a project that the town is interested in right now, once we submit this, uh, the, the current 90 million that's out there for hazard mitigation projects with no match, you can access that money. So we're specifically speaking about town, town solely. Within the town boundaries, what you can control within the town okay. boundaries. Uh, uh, I mean, you can put some stuff in there, like as far as uh, we can definitely put recommendations for when they timber uh, on the in the forest over here of you know the town would like to see you know best uh, best management practices, especially for water retention. And yeah, we can put those thing sort of things in with the appropriate language, you know that. Uh, no, don't want to waste the time. I want to understand what you're here for. Yeah, well, I mean, but that's part of what we are here for, you know. So that does, is included, and that will be, you know, is in the mitigation actions. That is exactly the kind of stuff which, pretty much, as soon as we roll through this, we're going to start discussing all those kind of ideas, so that we have a mitigation action for each one of the uh, uh, listings there. Yeah, slide one. There you go. Okay. okay. So the next main hazard type uh, in the town is ice storms. So this is, you know, uh, uh, generally your freezing rain. You know, uh, you know uh, the probability of that is a three. Uh, is what that came up with. Uh, three is uh, between. So they use a really broad range here, anywhere from a 10% to a 75% chance. I know that's super broad, uh, but ice storms was the uh, was rated as a three. Uh, damage to infrastructure was given a three. Uh, risk to life is two. Risk to the economy is three, and risk to the environment was two. Uh, we are seeing a lot more of these ice type events, and it only takes a little bit more than a quarter inch of ice on power lines. Uh, I think, it, if I remember right, the, it's a quarter inch of ice on a uh, with a 10 mile an hour wind is like adding an extra 200 pounds to that power line. Let's go to a half inch. You're almost guaranteed that's going to start breaking. You know, uh, GMP uh, gave a presentation that. Uh, at our regional emergency management committee, and they even talked about this as you know, we've seen almost a complete shift in uh, weather events in the winter time over the last three years. Used to be uh, historically, you would get uh, about nine weather events that were they considered extreme events in the winter time. That it was almost like all light, fluffy snow though, and you would get like one wet snow ice event. They've seen that totally shift the other way, and they're seeing only one powdery snow event generally, and everything else is coming as wet snow. In the southern part of the state, they have 36 inches of wet snow in one snowstorm. You know, uh, the power guys were out up to their waists. They had a bunch of photos for it, but you know they're seeing it uh, with their infrastructure. Uh, are you? You're all on wet, or are you on GMP? The, the stream out here. Okay. And. Um, Washington Electric on the other side of the, basically the other side. Okay. okay. Minister Brook. Yeah, uh, GMP is actually burying a lot of their uh, lines in real problem areas now. Uh, they've got this really cool rock saw that they can cut through anything. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, and they're, they're using a, you know, a bulldozer with that and actually burying lines in, in uh, some of the problem areas. And they're just like everybody else, the, the power lines are generally run wherever uh, was the easiest back in the day. Uh, they're trying to move them all next to the roads as well so that they're easier to access. Uh, yeah, uh, the average score for ice was uh, a two and a half, and it gave uh, a seven and a half overall score. Uh, so it, it fell into, I think, the top tier. Yeah, yeah, I was just gonna actually make a comment. Do we want to, since we got through ice, and, you know, obviously, if anybody has, you know, wants to up that, we can talk about those scores. But maybe we jump to cold. Yes. To that yeah, priority. And then the other ones, you all have the scores of the moderate and low threats. So maybe we could just, instead of going through each one of those, you just let us know if we bump any of those up, and then we can dig into them individually. But 
Just to keep it going? Yeah, yeah, just to keep it yeah. fast. Okay. Yeah, so cold was rated right probability of three, uh, an extreme cold event. You know, risk to infrastructure was a three, life was three, uh, economy is two, and environment was two. Uh, you know, obviously, if, if you mix in a severe cold event with a power outage, you know, that's where that risk of life really goes up. You know, if anybody, especially uh, older individuals, anybody that, you know, may be stuck at home, uh, especially if somebody's by themselves, you know, and also your risk of you know carbon monoxide poisoning and all the other pieces that can go with that uh, go up significantly. Uh, if anybody has any disagreements with that score, okay. Like uh, Lincoln said, you know the the next ones are all kind of in the moderate threat. We uh, you know we'll still have to come up with a mitigation action, but it's not it wasn't listed as one of the top priorities from the planning team. Uh, On your list. Seeing that landslides is under other hazards with low likelihood. Yes. I'd like to disagree with that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's um, I think it's probably closer to a moderate threat um, it, because it's a more of an end result of several other events that like the flooding and the overwhelming. Yep. Which leads to landslides. Okay. So I would argue that right. you know, that's why it's important that maybe landslides are a moderate threat as opposed to low other hazards with low likelihood. Okay. Uh, so discussing landslides and it, the overall probability was uh, rated as a one. Yeah. Uh, you know, what are, are you thinking like to an occasional, uh, which would be like a one to ten percent chance? Uh, yeah, I was thinking more of a moderate threat as opposed to the lower score. Could, could I add yeah, here? Absolutely. So I would like to partially agree and partially disagree with her. I think landslides are not necessarily, like they're obviously very site specific, but what I would agree to is that all of this uh, fluvial erosion, as you're calling it, yep. um, makes power outages much more likely because everything is undermined, like every tree along the roadsides is fucked. And they're just gonna start tipping over and we don't even know, like it could be a little tiny bit of wind and the power goes out, and we don't know, like, why did that happen? And it's like, what you're saying, it's not a landslide, but it's every single tree along every road has no more root base, and so they tip over. So I don't know if there's a way you could filter that into your matrix there, but I, that's what I see. Yeah, I think in, in interpreting what we think of as a landslide and right. probably what the feds interpret as a landslide are two different things. We, we, we think of, uh, like on the Callis Road, if uh, up by one of the culverts, or some of the side hill that's loose that comes down into the road, we may consider that a landslide. Sure. I, I, they, I, they, they, may, they may consider if all of Callis Road gets covered, yeah. gets inundated on, and with a landslide. That's what they may be considering a landslide. So it may be more of, a, like you're saying, uh, the inclusion and as, a, as opposed to a landslide. That's one of my biggest concerns over the last couple of years after all of this water is, is the, the undermined roadsides. We, we have steep valleys where our roads are. The trees, when they don't have any root base, they fall over the like, slightest no oh, yeah. rain or wind but, or ice or whatever. But at, at the same time, it doesn't hurt if we if we feel like the landslide should be bumped up to a two. So whatever you want to call it, but that that's that's the thing that I see as being a like, bigger hazard than just being an acknowledged. I'm just keeping track of hands. Can we have a hand up? Can we have a hand up in Michelle? Yeah, this I, I mean my comment is really tied into conversation now and it's just more of like uh, how are all of these individual things looked at together? Because I I I feel like we're getting somewhere maybe after this slide. So I I know Like, it, like, I mean, it, the state and, and the federal government, it, 
they're aware that, you know, like last summer, you know, we obviously had both these two flooding times at the same time. We also, while those storms were going on, also had some severe wind. You know, so often, you know, and, and they used to kind of break it up a little bit where you could say like severe storm with like two or three of these conditions. They, yeah, it's like, it, it, yeah, I think it's, you know, they want to see the, the towns going through this process so we can have a conversation, you know, and they, this is their formula of just like how can they standardize and check the box that's been done, but it's about this process and, you know, everybody coming together acknowledging it's not one or the other, it's these compounding things that are getting worse yes. and worse. They want to see that reflected in the plan that we've had these conversations and there's public input. And so you all, you know, so you can access the funding assistance. I think it sounds like in terms of the landslide conversation, if we just make that a two across the board, is that? Yeah, yeah, because that, that, that And then it's going to become a moderate hazard? Yep. We'll yeah, that, that would be very, an easy way to do that. And then there's a camp here and then there. So a landslide, sliding down of a massive earth or rock from a mountain or cliff. Yes. More appropriate would be like a rock fall or a mudslide because we don't have any roads that are right next to a mountain or a cliff that are pretty far down in the valley. So landslide is kind of semantic. Exactly. It's a semantic because realistically yeah. we see more uh, what's mud called mass slides. slumps. Uh, other is, is the, other the, is uh, the uh, more geologic term for what it actually is yep. in our region. Uh, but yeah, yeah, mass wasting is also another way you can refer to it. But it's just that the, if it ends, if it's dirt that actually ended up on the road and it wasn't just washed out there, technically that would qualify. You know, it, but yeah, it's semantics. You know, yeah. it's uh, you know, and usually almost all our landslides here are caused by flooding. You know, I mean, Barry City we had 22 last year. You know, it was all during that flooding event. We were so saturated. You know. Uh, how the one gave way and hit three cars on 62, you know, with trees, you know, not where you th expect to get sideswiped. Uh, <laughs> or by what she expected to be sideswiped, but, uh, yeah. Michelle, did you? Yeah. And then we'll um, get to Bill online's got to hang up. Yeah. yeah, I totally agree. We can't separate out ice, snow, and apologize. Yeah, I apologize to everyone, but I have to attend a, uh, an emergency CBRPC meeting right now, so. Carry on. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, you can't separate out uh, ice, snow, and wind. <laughs> yeah, you know, it, it's. You really can't because okay. that's when it's the worst. <laughs> exactly. Um, also, I'm not sure why cold is in the worst threat because it is totally not cold anymore. <laughs> You can actually when move USDA climate zones. Uh, yes. Yeah, yes. but I think, like, what he had said before is, like, when there are those times of cold, when, and then power goes out, that's when it becomes like, the so, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. 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 It's going to be combined with the wind yeah. event or yeah. 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 I agree. Yeah. Well, exactly. if it's, if it's yeah. like, one of the things that's easier for us to mitigate, actually. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 And often, in our the way we kind of handle the cold in the actual uh, overall descriptions, when we go through this, we usually kind of, in a lot of times we lump the hot and the cold extreme together and just kind of put the answers for both, you know, uh, both those together. Because to be honest, we're starting to see a lot more of the hot weather events. You know, I mean, obviously the summer is a perfect example. Multiple days above 90 degrees. You know. Uh, most of our homes, such as the older structures here, aren't designed for that, you know, because they were designed with everybody worrying about the cold. But they don't actually breathe appropriately for dealing with that heat, you know, especially when we're having nights that are still in the 70s, mid 70s or so, uh, that risk of then uh, people who either uh, have asthma, uh, some kind of pre existing condition, or uh, just the age, having trouble uh, lowering their body temperature and you can end up with more heat stress and just uh, hospital visits in, in general. Because you can actually metrically see if you have a 90, if it's over 90 degrees for more than three days, uh, uh, the federal government has been able to track that you can honestly see your hospital room visits go up proportionally based off that. And the longer that lasts, the more it goes up. Uh, and especially if there isn't that time to acclimate before you get that. So you're seeing the game was operating by air conditioning? <laughs> <laughs> Not yeah. yet. 
they are willing. You can actually One to apply. Six, remember? Would it? You were dragging. Well, I was saying they can uh, sign it, apply to, like, you could apply for a community pooling facility where you would get money for, like, a uh, town hall structure or something like that that you could then use if you have those days that you would open up. But yeah, they're not for individuals. They will. They're, they're not going to do that. I'm not that soft. I'll suck a dick like a man. <laughs> they just go lay in the stream for a while. Yeah, like, pull off. <laughs> All right. Yeah. All right. Okay. Yeah. So, on. yeah, I think the question is, is anybody still wanting to change any of the current ratings of these threats, or should we move on? Just the payout. Just yeah. the payout. All right. We'll take that as a final comment. I, guess, I, I do have just one question. I think everything on there makes sense. It's that one of the things that, I was, that I've been really struck by is the environmental impact of especially the inundation flooding, but they, like the people's basements mm -hmm. um, and their fuel tanks. And okay. I feel like most of that impact happens downstream. And I actually don't think Worcester ended up being a major contributor to that because of where our houses are located. But overall, there was a lot of fuel in the oh, river yes. that mm -hmm. flowed into our Champlain. And th this doesn't even seem to really speak to that in a meaningful way. So I did, I think it probably makes sense for Worcester that that would be a three, but it's another example of like it's all connected. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I don't. I just was a question. Well, we're not going to suffer from those impacts here in this town. Not in this no, town. No, no. But, but we, we may be contributing to them. True. A yes. few years ago, the state had everybody that has outdoor tanks had to put them on slabs, and they were inspected. Yes. I, I think that it's not, I think actually most of that probably wasn't coming from Worcester, and I don't think Worcester is like a super high risk to a major contributor to that, but I, it was just a question. No, no, I, I agree with that 100%, especially like in Montpelier last year, while the floodwaters were still up. Uh, uh, and the, 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 it was the uh, day after, you know, so I mean, the waters were still up in the city, and we saw people recreating oh. in the water, you know, and like, uh, I'd gone down to uh, check to on the uh, whether we could even get back into our office and how close we could get. Uh, I live over on County Road, so just made it to the traffic circle and was horrified to see people going in that water because you're like, not a, you know, there's any rat poison, whatever you've got in your basement, you know, whatever chemical is around the house in a lot of those structures that was in that water, besides uh, sewage discharge, whatever else, you know. Wow. Yeah, you got fuel, you know, like, I knew people that actually did go in that and ended up getting rashes and all that stuff, and you're like, yeah, that is not safe, you but should not recreate. Like, for Worcester, you would think a three is reasonable for us. Yes. Well, this is, this is a, you know, this is a housing planning team, when we do the score rank with them, it's not, you know, by no means we're telling you what the risk is for your town at <laughs> yeah, all. Yeah, exactly. And if you all decide right now, hey, this is a risk to the environment, beyond Worcester, you know, we can bump it up. These are already the worst, considered the worst threats, but if you want to, like, drive that message home, like, no, it's not a three, it's a four. You know, this is... Well, clearly, we're higher in the watershed. Everything that fucking goes on here is going to travel downstream. Like, yep. we're not yeah. isolated. Yeah, exactly. I, think, I think you got your fine as far as, like, Worcester, you know, you're thinking about diesel fuel and, on, and all of those things. Maybe we're not there. But I'm starting to hear stories about septic systems and leach fields that have yeah. failed and have been washed away and have been washed into yeah, but it doesn't that wash there, in Western that Western weren't in there before. <laughs> 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 I guess I, there's, I, I hate to do that and I'll sometimes like, it's a three because we don't feel the impact. It's like if, if, yeah. Yeah, if, if you, I mean, yeah. as, as the group, would, do you think that that should be bumped up? To a four Are you talking about like which one specifically? I'm talking about the environmental impact of flooding. The flooding. Oh, flooding. Okay. Yeah. yeah, I really like the environmental impact, not yeah. like which is barely. Well, do you feel like but... shit is a huge contributor to like degradation of the environment? Like, that's what it is. It's a health Mostly, risk. we're not washing a lot of people away. We're washing my septic systems and like overflow leach fields. Like that's it. Maybe a three is. We don't have a lot of industry to deal with, and that's kind of cool. It's just all residential mostly. I'm fine with being a three. And we can always, we can always revisit it. Exactly. Yeah.
actually. We're, we're kind of looking at like a, the thing that starts to put together the framework for the plan. We haven't seen the plan yet, and we might see that, and some of this stuff might be addressed reasonably well. Or once we go through and see those things, it could be like, wow, this is totally missing that. In which case, we might still want to approve it now just to get it through, but then make a the point that we come back you know, three months or six months from now and I think it would be an opportunity, let's just say, that once we get this all done and the select board approves it and it goes downstream, you know, to everybody else down through there, then, then once we have some sort of a plan, if somebody wants to see it, we can we can make it happen so that you can view it either on your screen. I mean, it's 40 some odd pages. You may not feel like burning them all all the time, but we could make it available to everybody so that yeah. then you can digest this for six months or so and maybe talk to some people that aren't this? here and then so put it together. To go forward here? Yeah, yeah. We, we, <laughs> we're on a short time frame. I think yeah. we're on a short time consensus yeah. that we're moving forward from, the, yep. from this part. After that, it becomes what's known as a living document. Exactly. Yeah. This is a living document. Right. Where it's being used in the yeah. document. Yeah, document because it's always being used. Exactly. We got and a actually, the town is supposed to update, at least just do an update on the mitigation actions once a year mm -hmm. and try to get that input from the community. You know, if anybody wants something added or something. But, uh, yeah, if you want to add anything to this, it's it's not written in stone. You know, at any time it just takes that uh, select board vote to add any new information into it. If the select board agrees, you can add whatever you want. Uh, so yeah, yeah. Now at the region, you know, we can help you if you need help. You know, if you, if you're wanting to do anything like that. Okay, this is just uh, this is just showing some of the damage tables from the county. Uh, you know, uh, the state compiles these already pretty much for every event um, and we're able to get most of that information, especially in the state has a mitigation plan. Uh, and then, you know, we add in any new events that come along. Uh, so last year, that flood was uh, DR 4720. We are actually still waiting for the final damages calculated for the county. We're almost there, <laughs> you know, but, you know, obviously that's part of the FEMA process and uh, uh, some of that is because, like in Montpelier, the uh, state buildings and the city buildings and St. Mary City, they've been stabilized. They are not remediated, they're not fixed. You know, so if you go into a lot of the structures, especially in the uh, basements, the walls are cut off about two to three feet up from the floor. And it's, there's no drywall or whatever on those, you know, they've just stabilized them. Uh, you know, for the state buildings, I think it was 24 million just to get them to stabilize them. Because some of those had six, seven feet of water. Mm -hmm. And in, in the plan, you are going to see a lot of county level data because in some places that's just like the, the most granular information that we have access to. We're working with the town to try to get as much specific information to update the numbers in the 2019 plan. But FEMA also wants to see the explanations of the hazards on a, on a county level. So that will be in the plan as well. And some of it will reflect the, state, the state's plan. Yeah. Yeah, most of the towns in our region don't actually track damages per storm. It's just not, because the way you file for FEMA and you file for damage locations, it isn't for that storm. So it's not, the framework isn't set up there really for tracking at the town level of individual storms. Um, so yeah, we often use the uh, county damage tables just to uh, achieve that goal that FEMA requires for these plans. Uh, next slide. Okay. Uh, we're going to take just a couple minute break. Think for everybody to think about, you know, uh, if anybody has to go to the bathroom, get a uh, quick snack. Uh, then we're going, we'll delve right into like mitigation actions for each one of these and try to come up with a good ballpark list uh, that then we can kind of tweak a little bit and uh, put into this one. Okay. Okay. All right. Good deal. Yeah. Okay, yeah, thank you. I'm over here. You guys have a panel on two. These are our numbers. Yes. But capture some of this discussion. Yes. Oh, yes. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Because he was actually recording us. I'm recording. Yes, he was. Exactly. Is that the start of the side conversation stuff is actually important? In my opinion, more important than that. Yeah. I mean, exactly. Speaking of what we were required to do the review, but yeah, the side conversation. I saw him. Yeah, I don't know. 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 I don't know.
has some different strategies and goals that correspond with the river corridor plan in this case in terms of moving some of these projects forward. So it's not like we're throwing away the river corridor plan. It's a place to start, but you know, given, given the last couple of years of activity, we are really going to be relying more heavily on town input, what, what the roads department, what the fire department, what the planning commission, what the public has to say. This is what has to be done now because of where we are at and this, these disasters compounding. Next slide. Yeah, usually we uh, can look back at old stream geomorphic assessments and things like that to get culverts and that sort of thing that you know clearly are undersized or should be uh, upsized because they don't meet like bank for width some of the current standards that are being used. Uh, we're with your town, we're choosing, especially with this latest event, we're choosing not to do that. We're just trying to directly coordinate with uh, Roger and Mike, and, you know, and the uh, town staff to uh, get the locations of what hasn't failed in the last two years, but still is a problem, uh, you know, because obviously it's such a dynamic situation. Looking at older plans on those locations isn't going to do us a lot of good because so much has changed over the last two years. Well, also, um what I noticed is all the debris in the, which is clogging up the culverts and running over the road. Yeah. Those need to be cleaned out. That's one of the things that we're working on right now. After the engineer was around with uh, Mike Utten today, looking at everything, now that we've got something, he's going to start working on what we need to do to fix things. And what Mike and I are going to start doing probably on Monday is we're going to identify areas just like what you're talking about. And we want to start bringing people in there, maybe with, you know, with chippers or whatever and so on. Get this debris out of the ditch, just the wood and stuff like that. Get it out of the ditches. That plugs up the culverts. But we want to get that out of the way first. And we can use local people for that because, I mean, they know the roads, they know what's going on. We give them some of the parameters they got to work on. Get that stuff cleaned out so that when we come back to do the final repairs to the roads, we don't have to mess with that. We don't have that dirty stuff in the way. We've got dirt that we yeah. can use. Yeah. So that's, hopefully it will start up next week at the latest. Yeah. That, that's a great segue into this slide, just sort of those continued efforts of, you know, looking at the town plan at that goal of maintaining quality and safety of town road network through cost-effective methods that are appropriate for the town's topography. So you all are doing that. That's awesome. There's a transportation resilience planning tool, which is an interactive map, which, which highlighted Callis Road, Minister Brook, and Elmore Road that are some of the highest vulnerability to that erosional threat. Is, is there a reason that West Hill isn't on there? Right. That, that's the most destruction of any road I've seen around here. So there's gaps in it. I mean, like, you know, the level of what they're looking at is, you know, there's there's tons of gaps, and that's exactly why we're doing what we do. So West Hill Road's going on the list. I, would, that's I, like, big, yeah. I don't think anybody here would disagree with me on that. It's uh -huh. fucked like that, and it's been consistent. And it's important because it, it's a connecting road to the house. Yeah, it's, it's the only way to get it It's out. right here. All right. Okay. okay. Yeah. 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 Cool. All right. Thank you for that. And that's what that's what we're looking for. So just jump in. This isn't the official end of the conversation. This is the beginning of it, of what I could see from my laptop. You know? So stream geomorphic assessment, as, as Keith said, dozens and dozens of culverts on different streams. Um, but again, this is stuff that's going to have to be updated with the Can I maybe add what Robert's saying? Please. The, um, like, what, uh, you know? Oh. You're saying the the landslide or no? Sorry, um, the the trees along all the roadways. That's why the debris is plugging everything up. And like, I feel like I've advocated for a long time of like doing preemptive tree work along the roadsides to prevent power outages and plugging up all the culverts. It seems like a very easy thing to mitigate before it's a problem, and it just seems like that never happens. Well, normally it does happen. It's part of the summer road crew work. Well, I know, but it's never, it's never happened the extensively. Storms, it's like they're there's... dealing with the emergency stuff before right. they can get you the regular summer meetings. No, I know, but I mean, <laughs> like, the road right away extends much further out than it never gets managed, and there's so many trees that are like yeah. hazardous. The, the, the town right away, uh, if you look at it, Basically, for, generally speaking, 
where the ditch ends, that's pretty much the right of way for the town. It's 25 feet from the center, from the center out to the side. So where you're seeing ditches now, for the most part, yeah, there's going to be places where it's a little closer or there's a ledge or whatever, but for right. the most part, where that that's ditch is, yeah. that's, the, that's the end of the town maintenance area. The only thing you can do there is you start working with easements on everybody's property to go deeper into their land. I think probably, pardon me, but you probably play hell to try to get in deeper into somebody's land and start cutting trees. I know that's a cluster to navigate, but that I think is what would, would help keep all of these things. We also noticed last year and this year with stuff that was with the material that was coming off from West Hill, it wasn't just within sight of the road. It was being it was being washed down where water didn't normally run. Right. You know, water's just going every place and it's bringing everything with it. And we really are hard pressed to try to figure out how we can mitigate that. Well, a few years ago, my neighbor and I watched the town uh, fill up our ditches with the leaves from the trees and we complained and nothing was done about it. And that caused trouble. Okay. Point made. Yeah, we also had some private logging done and they didn't pick up the brush and you can see it just quite huge culverts on a prior road. Yeah, but Mother Nature uh, was the biggest player in this game, Michelle. You know. Well, the same thing but uh, blockages made it worse. Okay, so I think we're going to dig into uh, to the meat of it right now. Uh, I just want to lastly point out the 2015 Worcester Stormwater Infrastructure Mapping Report did highlight three different locations for possible infiltration or retention basins on Calcid and Brook Road. It could be something to look into whether or not that was a feasible project. Um, maybe it was already done, or maybe it needs to still uh, be investigated. But So this is just where we started with the state level planning. Um, and I think we can move into. Can you add, you know, like, our, I just wanted to make sure that all the roads oh, yeah. are eroding. Yeah. Are those the only three that are currently on there, and you're adding West Hill as a position, or are you like, adding other ones? Yeah, so, um, you know, the, the mitigation actions that we're going to come up with are going to be site specific. You know, so it's going to be, you know, we need to do, we need to upsize this culvert on, on this road. And this was more of a conversation starter of, okay. you know, we, we have, uh, VTrans has put together, you know, mapping tools and they're able to look at a road segment and say, you know, how important is this road for transportation and what's the risk to houses and, and the river, you know, and that's just what they pulled, that's just what I was able to see is like, what these are the highest risk best. categories. But again, this isn't, real-time data, you know, yeah. it's whenever they, they logged it in. Yeah, they logged this in. When they created this tool, it was about 2019, 2020, so it isn't already dated. Um, uh, and they looked at what's the connectivity. So, you know, if there's another route that you could go around and still get to uh, whatever the destination, like outside of the, to get out of the town to get down to Montpelier, then uh, if there's a secondary route, then it wasn't rated as high, you know, and they actually, uh, in that resilience planning tool, wanted to try, you know, because if there is no, uh, if there's no secondary access to something, then that got it a higher rating, because that, because, you know, people would obviously end up being trapped, uh, especially if it was a main access road to the town, so like if it only went to, say, three houses, that doesn't get it as high a rating, but, you know, if it was, uh, uh, yeah, like the Callus Road, because really you're kind of almost here in Worcester. You've got 12, and then the Callus Road's your next main uh, artery to get in and out. So if it was on one of those, that would automatically kick up to a higher rate. That's why West Hill should be on that. West Hill. Yeah. It's the only other access. Yeah, on that side. Yeah. And Route 12 was closed from Worcester to Mount Miller and Worcester to Elmont. Yeah. So they're exactly. Yeah. Up back here. I just I have to leave, but I just back uh, to what Kyle was saying earlier. I just I'm thinking that you just scribble at it. I am a property owner who 
which says, I've contributed, or my property's contributed a lot of water to the Alice Road, and there's a big culvert that keeps on getting flooded, but as you'll see, there's a whole lot of water coming down the side of the road, so I'm feeling very responsible for the damage, although it's not. Anyways, I would love to see state money for private landowners to be able to put these um, catchment basins in. I'd be happy to put catchment basin in up higher. I mean, it starts higher than that, but I've done it a few times on my own, on, on the, closer to the house where the water can come down, he's in a catchment basin, and then it just mitigates the extent of the pressure of the water. Yep. And if it's definitely happening, as you all probably know, on the palace room, is a corner that gets overwhelmed time and time again, and it comes down on the south side of the road. And that's coming up off my land. I mean, as, as the street people were okay in the state to build catchments, uh, and I got money for it. <laughs> I think they have to do that and then solve problems. Yeah, yeah. Actually, the actually, the county can do that. We'll pass along any, because uh, there are funding opportunities out there. You have to along the planning commission to, to put out there um, for, for willing landowners like yourself to do some mitigation commissioning. So, appreciate that. All right. Yeah. We do the same thing on our road, uh, which would help um, mitigate some of the damage to us. So, you can get it higher up before it gets going really fast. I'm about building like a three million gallon basin. I don't know how many millions it would take, but some. Really and, it, and maybe several small ones instead of a huge pile. We're not going to build Rexville Dam on it. Yeah, yeah. Mill, but, um, you know, smaller ones. I don't know how much it costs. Makes yeah. sense. My question on this thread is are there other, aside from catchment basins, are there other mitigation strategies like um, restoring wetlands or like other things, <coughs> all the ways that we can promote um, water going into the earth versus running across it. DEC would be your point of contact for all that information. Okay. Yeah, yeah, because yeah, they manage they manage my property because I own class two wetlands and if you want to see how this works in action 100% successfully, we'll stand outside my house during these one of these events. You'll see this wetland just rise up a little bit slowly. It'll stay there, and then over time, it just slowly dissipates. But what it is, it's a catchment made by Mother Nature. And it does everything you want to do in your town plan. But, you know, you can't have a town in a place like that, but you could probably come up with a happy medium where places in the town, in strategic places, are those catchment basins. And you might find, if looking at the ANR uh, maps tools, that you might have that on your own property. You might have a class one or a class two, and you are beholden to that, and you can't encroach within 50 feet of it. Um, but if you do have those, I would encourage you to just maintain them, give them as much area as you can, because that's what allows the water to expand and then contract. Okay, so can we, is there a way we can, for a planning process, like, I think there used to be a lot more wetlands in Worcester, actually. It used yeah. to, I, I think I, I remember, like, hearing that the whole valley, and, like, it wasn't very suitable for you. I, I think probably the plan would be a good place to put something in there yeah. that maybe uh, we could say, like, the land that has been put into land use. Right. And there's A and R supervision and official wildlife, but of course the parks are supervision over that stuff. Maybe they need to come back and revisit their whole policies and procedures on everything. And maybe they need to expand on like what Dave was talking about in the future. But that's nothing a town could do, but if they're if these people are, are in land use they have forestry plans, they have plans that they have to draw up that have to be accepted by um, Forest and Parks and A&R and so on. That's the place where we can suggest they revisit their policies and maybe come up with new, new ways to address this situation. That's about the only thing the town could do. Okay. Oh, no, I bring us back. No, no, no. Uh, sorry. Yeah, no. yeah, I mean, there is a new focus from the state on uh, possibly recreating wetlands. Uh, I haven't seen any funding for that come out yet. 
But to be honest, I, I expect that they will. Uh, Probably. Yeah. Yeah. Within, I, within the next year or two, uh, DC has definitely uh, yeah, I know, been, been working on this. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. There's somebody who did that just um, the first house when you're coming up for it's called the first house in Worcester. Um, they did that on their own. They had connections with DC, uh, I think. And uh, they did that privately. Yeah. They're right on the North Branch. And there's, you know, a many number of uh, watershed organizations out there that will come do assessments at your property for free um, to look at you know, individual private situations. And you know, CBRPC can, you know, can also facilitate some funding for individuals. But we're moving into like talking about specific locations in the town. So let's go to the next slide, which might even just be a brainstorm, which we're kind of doing already. Yep. So you know, at this point in the meeting, and I want to be conscious of time because I know we're taking up the planning commission's uh, meeting. Um, we, you know, pr pr pretty much to get to here, which is our next final next steps, which is finalizing mitigation action. So we really want to become up, coming up with that list um, through public comments, through conversation with town officials, road department, fire department. What is it that we want to do? Highest priority, not the last thing we're ever going to do. We can, we can still come back to this plan, but we need to have that list. You know, it's updated and the select board can stamp. Um, there's going to be a rough draft of this plan, um, you know, in the not too distant future yes. that, that, that the hazard planning team is going to review. Uh, it's going to be released for public comment for a couple of weeks at least on the town website. The select board will do what we call preliminary adoption before it goes to Vermont Emergency Management. They're going to review it. That will, as soon as it gets submitted to them, that's going to increase your emergency relief assistance uh, funding score to, to the maximum 17.5%, so kind of the ultimate goal of having this plan, letting the town access that federal funding. So then, you know, the emergency management will bring it back to us and say, you know, this might be some things you want to consider, you know, drawing out more, uh, writing a little bit more about, we need some more information about X, Y, and Z. And then if that's done with the hazard planning team, and then boom, it goes back to FEMA, and it's good for the next five years. Doesn't mean you can't revisit it as a town. Doesn't mean such yeah, a it's, it's your plan. It's your, so it's your plan. You can revisit it anytime you want after that. You can call us back into it, and some of these, you know, broader town-wide studies could be part of a, an action that you want to you want to see through, and it might line up already with what's in your town plan. So. I think it's, this is definitely a tool for that too, some of the longer and short term planning. But for whatever time we have left, and I'm not sure what that is, but um, you I think know. You can, take, you can take the rest. There's nothing on our planning commission. Okay, okay. okay. So, timely, so, you know, maybe exactly. up until 730 ish. All right. Um, there, there are two things that I came here to say, and I'm going to leave you the fuck alone in the house. <laughs> uh, one is that the the entire operation of reconstructing our road systems, it was done by state-approved engineers. Mm -hmm. And I believe that the person responsible for re-engineering our road after last year was quite embarrassed of himself and even offered to refund his bill to the state. Um, so I think that it is only reasonable that we should at least be able to have a couple of different opinions about how to recreate structures that did not work and were very clearly not engineered properly. And there's a lot of people around here often responsible for doing the repairs, but they're under the, the supervision of somebody that is directing them. Should be able to have some input. Because when they make us rebuild a road that didn't work to begin with and rebuild it in a way that also was clearly not going to work and then it blows out again, like I don't I personally want my tax money to keep going to poor gravel into the same fucking hole. That kind of pisses me off, honestly. And secondly, I think it would be very appropriate as far as safety measures are concerned in emergency management practices that we'd be able to repair that many people's driveways so that they can get in and out immediately and not have to wait. I think that's total bullshit. And I don't think that it's fair to anyone. Like, my grandmother is 83 years old. Like, if her driveway blew out, I'm going to fix it. You can sue me if you want, but I'm going to do it. <laughs> but I think I feel the same way about everybody else. It's like, I would, I would go and fix any of these people's driveways immediately without asking to be paid but we should be allowed to do it and it doesn't matter like when somebody's coming to approve whatever we should just be able to fix them like just for the sake of like if an ambulance needs to come a fire truck whatever it is 
like. There shouldn't be somebody telling us we can't do anything until somebody comes and gives us the checkboard on their clipboard. Like, that's just, that's just a bunch of bureaucratic bullshit. And like, we need to be able to step ahead of that and like, help our friends. Step up. And when we can't do that, that's like, you're taking away the ability to be neighborly. I don't appreciate that. So if you can relay that, I'll stand up in front of anybody and tell them I think that's bullshit. So I'm going to leave you alone now. All yeah, right. Thank you. Point well taken on response time. On repairs. Okay. Uh, do you folks have? Yeah, I mean, if there's anything on this list that you have an idea of something you would like to mitigate, uh, you know, in action, uh, any ideas you have, this is um, so this is where we're brainstorming mitigation yes. options. Okay. So I know the select board has already been doing thinking about like warming um, to shelter, and it seems like that should go into the plan in some way. Can we talk about that? Um, there has been some discussions about well, we kind of went back and forth between the town hall and the school. Yeah. And the way it stands now is. This is interesting. I mean, the, the school is is going to be the shelter, be it a warming shelter or whatever. That's going to be the shelter. Interestingly enough, if the school runs into problems with the students, where the town hall is the shelter for the students. If they have to get the students out, this is the point for them. But I know that there's been discussions about using the school for an emergency shelter, especially in the wintertime when the power is out for so long and so on and so forth. But the, I, honestly, I feel like there's some other things that we could be doing as well in addition to that. Yeah. And I think part of that would involve the fire department emergent, and emergent, small emergency generators that could get out too. And we identify a list of people who are vulnerable and who don't, you know, mm -hmm. and so that we can at least have generators that the fire department can take out. Let's face it, the highway department's got their hands full. The fire department could come out and at least run a generator for a few hours, even in the summertime when it's hot and there's no power, to keep the medication cool and food cool for people in their 70s and 80s and that can't get around and so on. So I think those are things that we could probably work into the plan and should be put in. No, that's, I, say, I mean, I live in East Montpelier. I know we ran this with, uh, there was some individuals that are on uh, supplemental oxygen and uh, breathing machines, you know, and what was it, uh, December 23 when we had the, uh, like, six-day power outage uh, from the windstorm. You know, that was a perfect example of, you know, realizing we needed generators to be able to deploy directly to people's homes, you know, so you could keep them in their home, but they could still have their, their medical but, assist devices. Yeah, but I, I, one, one thing that we're battling with as far as the select board and the treasurer battling with is basically how deep are your pockets? I mean, if we're, if we're going to start rolling the fire department and, and supplying them with generators and so on and so forth, money's got to come from someplace. I mean, you can, you can talk about grants, but grants could be two or three years down the road. And, and but the only thing as far as I'm concerned, grants should be used for something that's a one-time expenditure. If you're using grant money to make something in addition to the town that's got to be taken care of in the future, all we've done is exasperate our budget down the road. But there's things I think, you know, if, if, if the select board could feel like and I'm talking from, uh, from, not from the select board point of view, I'm part of facilities and assets supervisor for the town now. I'm talking from that side of it. If we can get these things, I'm sure we have plenty of people, the volunteers and the fire department and so on and so forth, we are more than happy to do this stuff, but we gotta give them the materials to do it. So. Yeah, well, so I had another question or idea sure. that's connected to what you're talking about. Which, and Amy, before she left, she was like, she's like, if I stayed, I would talk about social infrastructure, which I'm not seeing any of that in the mitigation examples. 
but it seems like a really important mitigation condition and strategy. Uh, and I'm just curious how that shows up in hazard. Well, there's a thing that uh, and FEMA is in support of these. Uh, it's called a resiliency hub. So it's kind of, it's that social infrastructure piece. You know, in, uh, in Cabot, they're trying to set up uh, the Wiley Building, which is their town hall, because it's their shelter as well, as a um, uh, resiliency hub. And uh, it's kind of, it's the one-stop shop idea. So like, if you needed anything from the town, that would be that location in a disaster. That's where you go to. If, the, if you have to do, uh, say you had a really bad disaster and you have mass feeding, that's where you would go to get the food. It's that idea that you're trying any service you would uh, basically be provided from the town or even the state government would be coordinated out of that one location. Uh, it's an idea that uh, from the Regional Planning Commission idea, we, to be honest, most of our staff, and especially Sam Lash, our energy planner, we love this idea. Uh, you know, ideally, it's that, you know, because then you obviously try to uh, get backup power generation for that, whatever that facility is. Uh, but if everybody in town knows where it is, you don't have to communicate that out, because everybody already knows, especially in small towns like this. They've even done this in urban settings where there's that one uh, one place. So say, say we had another uh, pandemic type outbreak, everybody knows that's where I'm gonna go to get the inoculation if it's in my town, because when VDH rolls out, that's where they're going to show up. Yeah. Uh, and then from the administrator side of it, I look at it, that's all great. But we're going to have people that man it. Exactly. But, but if, if, if you had that, you know, I mean, obviously, it wouldn't be active all the time. But uh, if it was, then it would be, you know, your fire department people, if they're assisting, that's what they would be assisting. Yeah. Yeah. Like, maybe we, like, as a town, we create our own. Your town already does have that plan. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Like, I don't know that. Yeah. Yeah. We have like a network of people who say that in an emergency, I'm ready to come down and open up the town offices for the school. Like, I'm not a, a fire department yes. member or whatever, but we have like a group of people who are emergency management volunteers Perfect. and are ready to yeah. get called. And we can get you the training. But if you have a group of people, like let me know. I will get you whatever I training you, you want. Do or that. Need. And it would probably yeah. be really helpful. And, and if that yeah. already exists, maybe just like having more reminders. Yes. Like, yeah, your town actually does have like a like it's a local, local emergency, 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 emergency management plan uh, as part of the ERAP thing. That that's a requirement. Uh, those are updated yearly. Uh, pretty much every town in the region, you know, most every town even in Vermont has one of those. Uh, overall, we haven't done a great job of communicating that out to the community. Hey, every town has a plan of what do you do in this last event, you know, because uh, part of the plan, like I review these for every town, every town has a, a designated emergency operations center. Sometimes, uh, some of them, they, they do a virtual, like it's one person that primarily does it unless they need help assistance. but. Uh, when we call out to do local liaison reporting, which is in an event, the RPCs call every single town in, uh, in the state and check on what the damages are. Uh, and then we report that back to the state. That's who, that's where we even identify who we're calling at the town. It's, okay, this is the person, there's three people listed for town contacts, but it also describes what is that town's plan for responding. Are you saying that doesn't live in this in yeah, that's in another plan. Um, so this plan is just mitigating we hazards. Have update every five years. We have a yearly one, a local emergency management plan that we update once a year. Yes. Just confused, isn't that related to hazard mitigation? That no, that's response. that's your actual response. That is your response. Your fire drill. Oh. Yeah, yeah. That's this yeah. is you know this is what do we do like to prevent the fire. Right. <laughs> yeah, prevent the, This is what we do to prevent the fire. That is what you do once it's already on fire. I guess what I'm saying is it. Yes. right it's not black and white by any means no. um, this is bringing up a question i did want to ask 
the challenge is about that um, NFIP coordinator. Is William Baker still on the Zoom? Uh, I don't know. So I think because the town um, should have an identified court a coordinator for yeah. somebody who is the you know National Flood Insurance Program coordinator. So they kind of coordinate assessing damages and figure out what the damage was to private residents. Is that William Baker? Do we believe? Yes. Okay. All right. So we'll want to we'll put that in this plan, and we might want to indicate that possibly on the website even, just so FEMA can know that they the town knows who that person is. Um, so, yes, if you actually have homes that are substantially damaged in an event, uh, your zoning officer or you know who's often the NFIP person, uh, or you know if there's any permit process, you know some towns don't have zoning. Uh, well, could remember if you guys had it or not. Forgot to check. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, well, it's still the, then it would be usually whoever handles the NFIP. That person is who actually goes out. Uh, usually, state somebody from the state will come and assist them, uh, like the floodplain uh, managers or somebody like that to actually do those initial assessments of homes. You know, if they hit that more than fifty percent damage mark, because there are different rules. You know, if you have a structure that gets severely damaged. One more question, which is you talked about roads that either need to go away or be moved, and I'm curious whether you, whether that's something which you're thinking about just earlier. Really, are there any sections of the roads, any of the roads that shouldn't be repaired? Because they're just going to fail over and over and over yeah. again. Or they, like need to be, said, they need to be moved to a different place? Or there's, there's, there's a, a long process, yeah. Yeah. a very long process. And, and for a lot of people to say, well, West Hill isn't just, it's not working anymore. We're going to put in another road and we're going to, we're going to throw up West Hill. The town just absolutely uh, removes itself from all of the right of way and everything and that land reverts back to the property owner and thou shalt not build another road on there. <laughs> yeah. It's, uh, it's pretty much what it boils it's down to. It's impossible to build another road. Pardon? It's basically impossible to build another road. Even it's not impossible. We just don't have pockets that deep. But yeah. you know, you could do it. I mean, when you think of like the county road, yeah. when you travel the county road now, that's up on top of the ridge. Yeah. yeah. You know? And that's great. But West Hill, you can't. The only way you could do it is if every one of those driveways or landowners had a road that came down to Minister Brook with a bridge going across Minister Brook to connect with the Minister Brook Road. That's about the only other way yeah. you could do it. it. It's a very long process. Like, it, it wouldn't be something we'd delve into here, but uh, we do have communities that are asking us to actually start a, the longer uh, review and study of their roads. Uh, being pl plain fill being one of them. Be yeah. Like, uh, exactly. Tr just trying to think: Is there any pieces? Could we make adjustments in certain locations? And obviously, most of it is going to have to stay the same. But are there, you know, especially if you do a map analysis, is there any place you could possibly uh, do something to change the road infrastructure? Or building an elevated road as Jersey, Colorado. The problem is it's just ridiculously expensive to build it up on stilts, basically. Yes. Uh, but the bedrock is there on what it's held to do it. I know the engineers, well, we've chatted about that a little bit, but probably the next step that you will see if we can make it work with the state and so on, uh, West Hill, the water is telling us it wants to go down to that bedrock. Yeah. There's a 20-foot ditch there, but it's telling us that's where it wants to go. So he's going to start exploring the possibility of putting like four and under stone in there and then throwing cement in there to fill in all the gaps around all of the stones all the way down through. So basically, you have a cement ditch, and then we put guardrails up on West Hill. And we let Mother Nature do her thing. If that's the way she wants to go, we'll mitigate it as much of the runoff that we can with culverts and so on. But when it gets down to the bottom of West Hill, 
and then we have to figure out how are we going to be doing like what you're saying, what you see around the near wetlands. Yep. How are we going to keep that big force of water from carrying everything all the way down to Route 12? And that's where people live. Right. We're in that area. So that's, 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 what, that's what he's starting to think about it. We're just talking about it now. But because like I told him, I said, look, last year we probably put close to $800,000 into West Hill. We're going to put at least that much into it again this year. Uh, I don't know where my math figure's up there, but I couldn't think it figures up to the point where that's a little, you know, what, $1.6 million? If we had put $1.6 million into that last year with this plan in place, and if it held now, we're ahead of the game. Yeah. You know, but that is that is really down the road. That is just in the that's just in the um, bar room napkin discussion right now. Okay. I'll show you. Uh, just reading in a uh, in a comment in the chat. Yeah, this is all good material, and I just want to reiterate it again: it's not the last chance by any means. Um, you know, we're going to take what we hear tonight, um, what we've been hearing um, in our conversations with the housing planning team and, uh, you know, looking through the different plans that we do have access to and, you know, revisiting the 2019 plan to, to get something together so you all can look at that and, and we can get something through in time. Yeah, um, one quick question for you all uh, on earthquakes in most of these plans, most of our towns. We, so we are allowed to choose, you know, like we didn't create a mitigation action because we don't really think it's much uh, risk. And usually the earthquakes is the one in our region where kind of like most of our towns kind of agree. Are we going to, you know, what can we really do to mitigate earthquakes? Nothing. And yeah, yeah exactly. Nothing. Not really. And nobody's going back and changing their structure, their, change their, it. their full houses <laughs> to build to earthquake proof designs. And uh, like I said, historically, between twos and uh, two and a three is generally what's seen in this area. Uh, so, I mean, if, if if you all are fine with that, we'll handle it the same way here. We'll put in, you know, just two or three sentences to explain that to the state. And, and like I said, they're fine with that. Uh, you know, the rest of them, you know, generally we do see, I mean, I had a couple towns do the same with hail, but lately in the, in the last, in this year, kind of started to think maybe that's not such a good idea because we keep getting more of these events where they're like oh yeah there's a chance of hail in this next storm and like the other, one the other day uh, we didn't receive any in the region but they were uh, at least warning that it was supposed to be sizable hail if we got it you know so you know. and now we're worried about tornadoes yeah yeah and I mean realistically we're at least from the National Weather Service briefing with that uh, Scott Whitaker was like I know it says tornadoes on our side of the greens. He's like, don't really worry about it. He's like, the straight line winds would be worse than what the tornado would be. Uh, you know, and we all have experienced that. So <laughs> you're like, OK, you might see a tornado go by. At worst, it would most likely be an F1, uh, just barely able to get that. Because you know, due to the mountains, your, your, your risk here is extremely small for tornadoes. Um, OK, one more question. I'm sorry. Yes. What is a river corridor plan, and should we be thinking about that? I'll let you speak. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's a great question. So right now, you know, Worcester, in order to have the access to the National Flood Insurance Program and you know, access this emergency relief funding, you do have a uh, hazard, um, a flood hazard area regulation. So you don't have zoning, but you do have uh, regulations if you're in that flood hazard area. So river corridor regulations pretty much accounts for the erosional forces of the river, and it doesn't just look at inundation risk. It looks at, okay, we understand now and we can accept the river is doing this. So although my house is not flooding, it could be eroding slowly over time, and that's going to be a risk to infrastructure and life at a certain point. So the river corridor regulation has you know, pretty much the towns does what it does essentially for the flood hazard zone where it says, you know, if you're, um, well, there's different
different things, but essentially it limits or pivots building in that area. And for structures that are within there, they have to you know, elevate or do different things. Um, and I will say that in this last legislative round, the state is now considering uh, doing that on the state level yeah. and, and implementing statewide river, river corridor um, regulations. That's so that's, you know, that's more of like a three to five year down the road kind of thing, but it is coming. They're gonna, you know, think about how they want to roll that one out. But you know, in the not too distant future, all towns will have to be thinking about, you know, and it's not going to be for every little tributary. There's going to be some town discretion on how you actually interpret these, you know, state state regulations. But that's what river corridor regulations are in a nutshell. Well, so is there a state regulation that are, you know, that protect our river banks now? We already participate in, in yeah. those on, on a federal level. The federal guidelines are going to be for those federal lines. And, yeah. and, and, and the conversation is that the state is going to go beyond that and require the river corridor, you know, wider with the river. So based on that, does it seem like that would not be a great use of our time to try to create, put that in place? Yeah. Yes, yeah, that's, that's totally a conversation with the town. You it's, know, it's I mean, big, it's much bigger than bigger what, what, where we are on the federal piece of those, those maps. Maps are always evolving and we enforce that. Um, there's other things that will trickle down to that that will address it. Because the state comes to do that. Because for lack of so everything on the federal and state is yeah. how we function in the state department. And to that point, you know, FEMA is any day releasing the latest and greatest updated flood hazard maps. Right. So you so will see those. It's constantly evolving in the Okay. Yeah. Okay. yeah. And we will work with the town to adopt those. Because, you know, when those new maps come out, uh, we already have received uh, funding to assist the towns, right. you know, in those adoptions. Is that case updated in the NR maps? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, good. Yeah, so that will, once those are released, that's that, a great we'll be able to see that in the NR maps. It is. Yep. Okay. Uh, yeah, as I say, I guess uh, just if there, anybody had any other ideas of anything for this, we will we uh, we'll review all these, come up with a list. We'll definitely uh, have to meet with the planning team again uh, and review the mitigation actions that we've developed. Just make sure everybody's square, and we'll, we'll even put together a couple so like you have some options uh, for for that definite you know last choice. Uh, picking those and we'll institute everything that was you know everything that everybody said tonight try to include as much as possible uh, you know realistically within two weeks we will have the draft you know a draft to you yeah we've got, we've got our GIS map we're working on this on Monday to uh, do new maps for the town uh, and uh, you know yeah, well, the, the next public meeting, I think we'll try, uh, wh when's your next planning commission meeting? Yeah? Yeah. Yeah. Or would it be the Thursday in August. Okay, we'll, we'll, we'll meet, yeah, yeah, we'll need to move a little faster than that. Okay, because that's it, we can either do select board or, but we would just roll up that draft, basically, is, is that plan? Uh, that will deliver that draft meeting at that next public meeting. So that would be roughly three weeks, something like that. Could it be the select board meeting yeah. where they potentially? The select board meeting the next one is the fifth of August. That might be a little soon. Yeah, the fifth of August. Well, maybe we can do it. No, honestly. Yeah, yeah, August. Three weeks. Yeah. Yes, we'll tentatively go with that right now. All right. Yes. And so that would be, you know, a combined review and preliminary approval. Well, it, it, it would be. We'll just we'll deliver it to them, and hopefully, well, we'll have to wait until we see what the final date is with the, that 30 day. Okay. Um, if we need to move faster, we will. Uh, we'll, we'll deal with that. And you know, as soon as we get that, get what that is, we will definitely have a conversation. Uh, uh, but if that if that works, we'll go with that for. We'll present it to the town. That will give you that two-week window for that final for the uh, a vote of acceptance. 
you know, which, right. like I said, we may have to ask for a special meeting or something just to yeah. make that happen. But uh, I forgot we got to so do that. Before. If, if it occurs at the select board meeting, it would be it, would, it wouldn't be a protracted meeting like this. No, no, it, it would be a presentation. Yep. You uh, here it is. We hope. Would it be here it is? At, take you know, ideally. It'd be the start of the public comment period. Yeah, it might be the start of the public comment period. I may actually ask the state if we can do it. The way you're asking, if we present, if we could get it to you before the meeting, like, Josh, uh, we're. You know. All right, so it's the it's the 18th right now. Yeah, yeah, I'm trying, I mean, just trying can, to look at the calendar. If we can get it in, in uh, I don't know, two weeks, August 1st. No, it'd be, yeah, well, as I say, the earliest we could possibly get this done is probably the 1st of August, because uh, that gives us two weeks from today. So yeah, that, yeah, I think that fits. We'll plan on that. If you could get copies to us a couple days before yes. that meeting, okay. so that the elaborate select board could review it, exactly. then we can have it. A, a quick roll. Yeah. Yeah. And if yeah. it's still in our 30-day window. Yeah, sure that, that's what we'll just make sure we'll just uh but can they vote on it before the public comment period? If we can call it the meeting if you have it available, I would highly ask the select board to call it the meeting and have them Yeah, that's yeah. Really and that's what we that, 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 that very likely is what we may have to do to fit this in okay. and, and get like two weeks of it was up on the website yeah. for public comment just to just so we can verify everything and know that FEMA can't we, we basically don't want to give them any place where they can complain about our process yeah, yeah. yeah. As, uh, as we did for the town plan right. yeah yeah the same thing exactly getting that out there so you've got that it, it's a very similar process yeah. just like that uh, but yeah we you know, I think especially because they haven't come out with that even starting the, the uh, calendar on the 30-day uh, window yet. Uh, yeah, we'll, we'll be able to fit it. Yeah. All right. Should we close the meeting? Yeah, I'm. Um, I'm <laughs>